Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, EVP of Products and Services here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I am pleased to have Michael Weir as our guest. Michael is a technical account manager with Ingram Micro, one of the largest IT distributors in the country. Michael has deep technical expertise within a few domains, including networking security and solutions design. But we wanted to have him on Cut the Shit to hear more about his perspective on training and learning. Why, you might ask? Well, that's easy. It's because prior to moving into technology, Michael actually was a classroom teacher. He has a master's degree in adolescent education, and he spent almost a decade in a classroom trying to figure out how to successfully engage highly distractible young minds. We talk about Michael's past life in the classroom, how he parlayed that into a second career in technology, and how that training and experience have served him in his work helping tech users and practitioners keep up training-wise in the fast-moving world of IT. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Michael Weir. Michael, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing all right. It's a beautiful rainy day. How about you? I'm doing okay. Uh, It's sunny and really hot here. So um, where are you today? That does, uh, since we're obviously not in the same place, where, where are you today? Uh, just outside of Buffalo. Okay. Just outside of Buffalo, New York. It's not snowing yet, so we're in a good place. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's not August yet, right? So you still got a little bit of time? Exactly. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I've been asking people this and, and it's, it, the, the answers are starting to become more common, so I may stop asking people this, but I'll still ask. Um, you know, have you traveled much lately? I mean, we're we're all, we're definitely on the back end of the pandemic. You know, people are traveling, definitely traveling more, but people's situations, um, you know, with with hybrid work and some of that have have definitely changed. So, how about you? Have you have you been traveling any lately? So, I would say most of what I do at this point is still virtual. Uh, part of it's just the, the one-to-many approach, and that even you know, even though we can travel to individual places to talk to individual people, given that most of what I do is one-to-many, and not everybody's business can travel yet, that's mostly where I'm at is home-based stuff here. I will say on the weekends I go camping. I don't know if that counts as travel or not. Well, I think that's COVID-friendly. So that was you know, if I if I understood, there were I think the the camping business actually did okay during uh during 20 and 21 because people were like you know we figured out pretty quick that you know if you get outside. You're 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 okay. So I think people rediscovered nature maybe in a way they hadn't before. Hey, maybe I just preceded the trend, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I would imagine if you were already a camping person, that was probably frustrating to see people who didn't know what the hell they were doing, uh, trying to figure out how to camp. So that would have been that would be that'd be my conclusion. I'm not a camper. I'm not going to judge anybody. I'm interested in it, but I, I, if I were to go, I know the first thing I would do is call a couple of my buddies who are campers and make them go with me so that I didn't do uh, anything really stupid. Well, as long as you're still there, it wasn't that stupid. Still got all your fingers and toes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I didn't get eaten by a bear. So. Yeah, or take a picture next to the bear. I saw someone do that once. You know, <laughs> hey, little Johnny, get closer to the bear so we can get both in the frame. Yeah, big mistake. That's the difference there, yeah. Um, so before we kind of jump into the main event, why don't you tell me a little bit, uh, tell, give me, a, this is an exam, qu- question I've asked a couple of people and gotten a couple of interesting answers, but as you think back over the last couple of years and, and really moving into, you know, purely vo- virtual there for a while and continuing to stay virtual and it, for the most case, what is kind of, in, based on your opinion, what's the most interesting use of technology or hack that you've seen or heard about recently, either from clients you've worked with or colleagues? It could be anything, but anything interesting you've seen people, you know, that, that's been clever that they figured out? So I'll flip it to good and bad. I won't, the, the bad first, I won't say the name of the app, but there's an app out there. You can record like a minute loop of yourself sitting at a camera and nodding and then just play that loop during a, during a meeting so you can go off and do whatever you want. You still look engaged. Right. So there's that. Um, another flip side though is I've seen people get a greater proficiency with presenting technology like, you know, if you're in a room and you throw up a PowerPoint, you can point to this and point to that and kind of move around. But when you're virtual, that's, you know, unless you want to point at somebody's screen and have your finger, you know, do this. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really work out. So people have been using, you know, highlighter and circle tools or people have been implementing things like, you know, um, any of the Microsoft or smart tools or something like that to allow you to write on a screen. 
Yep. And hopefully as we go into, uh, you know, more of us returning to the office and that kind of thing, those, those more engaging presentation skills stay around. Well, that's a, that's a good lead in. Cause we're going to talk a good bit about that. I do think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ground to cover as it relates to, uh, to training, uh, particularly vir- virtually, given your background. So with that, to, to kind of get started, why don't you give us a thumbnail, scr- a thumbnail sketch on your background and talk to us about sort of how you got from little guy, little guy Michael to now. So uh, don't maybe maybe again thumbnail. So you don't 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 have to go too deep. <laughs> well, when I was when I was very young, I had just been born. So no, <laughs> um, I've I've held a lot of careers. I, I was telling it up with one of my coworkers. I think I've held eight careers. Uh, since I started working places full time, so I've been everything. I worked as a technical producer, technical, um, I don't say writer, sound, video, whatever you want to call it for a, for a local TV station. Basically, I was I was a one man show for all the editing and that kind of thing. I've worked in a recording studio. I had my own sound production business. From that, I have moved on to. I was a car salesman for a while. I was a teacher. I was a plumber. Uh, let's see, there's a few other miscellaneous things in there. Uh, tech trainer. Uh, specifically video games and education for a while okay. a whole a whole plethora of things about the there's a couple of themes you can go through most of what i did was very process oriented whether it be teaching or plumbing or sales or something like that is very process oriented stuff and all of it maybe with the exception of the being a technical director thing was something that i needed more and more communication skills as we've rolled forward and people don't think about that for a plumber but i will say uh, it's a very underappreciated thing to get the people you're working with or working for to understand exactly what it is you're doing. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I want to horn in on a couple of those, mainly around the teaching side, just given, again, we just talked about a little bit around, um, you know, you're given a couple of examples of some things you've seen um, in, in online training or online presentation. So, um Talk to me about your teaching career. How did that come about? And then sort of how did it end? Like how, how'd you get from, from, from that being an interest to sort of make, taking a step in another direction? Right. So uh, my master's degree is in education. I actually have, I have a certificate, a certificate in networking and associates in IT, a bachelor's in politics, a master's in education. And I wasn't that far off from a, a doctorate in education before I decided to change careers. Um, I'll string it all together. So when I became a teacher as part of that, uh, you know, someone who just got out of college and has a desire to change the world thing. All right. And I enjoyed the aspects of teaching that involve stuff like that. But I found that kids aren't exactly the greatest to work with. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was one of those people. The act of teaching is something I enjoy. I enjoy teaching, training, uh, instructing, that kind of thing. But at the same time, even though I was doing junior high and high school, there's something about kids that's always unpredictable in nature. And there's whoever you're presenting to is going to have that unpredictability in nature. But like, you know, um, one of my favorite examples is somebody put, this is in junior high, put little straw pieces up each of their, each of their nostrils and said, oh, look at me, I'm a walrus, I'm a walrus. And they tripped and fell face first. And when they stood up, blood was coming out of the two straws. And it was very humorous. But at the same time, it was like, you could have all the classroom discipline in the world. And there's no way to foresee Right. Something like that happening. <laughs> things like things like that. And I mean, and that's the, just I a regular in, week in junior high, too. I mean, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But either way, when I was teaching, a uh, big part of what I did was tech. So when I was a teacher, I was also level one tech support for my school. OK. Was that common or was that just because of your background? So I don't want to say it was necessarily my background. It was more uh, my ingenuity. OK. I, I, well, you had mentioned network stuff. I thought maybe you had done that before. So you already knew knew some stuff. But um. What I did at, at the school was less networking and more just like, you know, workstation repair. And um, because we didn't have the greatest budget rebuilding laptops out of scrap laptops. And can you fix my computer? Right. And and that 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 question came up regularly, it sounds like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just kind of like being that all service, all services utility tech, we actually used an MSP for our networking. So. Oh, OK. OK. Fair enough. Fair enough decision. Gotcha. That makes sense. But as, as I as I went through that from being the tech support there. Um, I always wanted, I always like to integrate technology into my teaching because when students exit the classroom and go out into the real world, everything's going to be tech. You know, yeah. if they sit there and, you know, write on a piece of paper and then they go to their first job and their first job plops down a laptop in front of them, they better know how to competently use that laptop right. and not, you know, fall into disinformation, have it, you know, reduce their productivity, things along those lines. So by the end of my teaching career, I was doing as much tech training as I was teaching. Um, 
I was part of a, a consortium of teachers using technology and education. Um, I was district and statewide trainer for various smart technologies for video games and education. Uh, things along those lines, I would consider more innovative techniques, not not like a pat myself on the backside of innovative techniques. I didn't necessarily come up with any of these things, but I, I tried my best to take them to teachers who didn't know these things. And the reception varied wildly. Sure, sure. Um, as, as I reached the end of uh, my teaching career for, like I said, not really enjoying kids, <laughs> those little brats, uh, <laughs> as I reached the end of my teaching career, um, was uh, just about, I would say, it, it was prior by about a year or two to the um, Eternal Blue and Eternal Rocks leak when the, when the whole ransomware epidemic really started. Right. And I thought back to like when I was in college, one of the, one of the kids in my dorm on the floor was majoring in IT and one of his focuses was security. And I thought back to like stateful packet inspection was huge. Right. Actually, I don't think it was state. It, we had just moved past AC. Like you're talking like Cisco picks yeah. type stuff, you know. And uh, it kind of something something snapped in my memory. Like, wait a second, there's more to do than just lay here helpless, you know, and wait for the ransomware to come bowl me over. Like, there's people that can actually do stuff about this, and that's sort of how those two things uh, came together. Gotcha, gotcha. And so that was that kind of what motivated you to begin to look in a different direction and maybe mar- marry up what I'd call sort of a an interest in education, so more like an adult education approach. Uh, you know, married to technology. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I have my identity stolen twice because uh, apparently I don't learn from my mistakes. And both times I caught it very early. My, my bank caught it very early and I got everything straightened out and that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I, I fancy myself to be tech savvy. And I was thinking if this happened to like my parents or even some of my friends, you know, their whole life would be destroyed. Right, right. right? And if they go to work and they introduce a piece of ransomware into their workplace, you know, now they're out of a job. And I think a lot of to a lot of people, this idea that there's cyber possibilities for these cyber things go wrong. It's a NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. Right. It's not going to happen to me. And then it does. And you know, this is this is uh, something where the virtual, in an entirely, it can function entirely in virtual, entirely in in cyberspace, but can absolutely ruin your, you know, regular planet Earth life. Oh, for sure. So you for know, sure. I, I said like, if there's something important to do with tech. No offense to smart boards, but I think uh, I think network security is going to make a much bigger effective difference in people's lives. That makes sense. That makes sense. And and you know now, I mean, I I guess I'd get your opinion on this. You know, the the term network security, in a lot of ways, it isn't. I mean, it's both descriptive, but not necessarily complete either. In the sense of the framing around that, right? Because one of the things that we've found in talking to customers is oftentimes there's the, there's the NIMBY aspect that happens to other people, but then there's also like, well, that's what, that's like what the smart guys, that's the, that's what do you engineer technology people do? I just use a computer, you know, like I'm not a, I'm not really part of the problem or even, you know, part of the potential problem when the reality is now it feels like we talk about ransomware. I mean, network security in the sense of, you know, outside in protection with firewalls, et cetera, I mean, that's not really the issue, right? Oh, yeah. And when it comes to most ransomware, it's email, right? I mean, email is the problem. I mean, if if you wanted to kill ransomware, you'd start by literally getting away, you know, just doing away with email, which everyone, of course, says, well, we can't do that. So, I mean, there you go. Therein lies the rub, right? The, the most basic of technologies is the biggest vector. Um, so it's a really interesting both kind of framing or sort of meta issue Um because the thing about the stories in the news, a lot of it is around, you know, Chinese hackers or North Korea or Russian. Whatever. And that stuff happens. I mean, don't get me wrong. And, that's, and there's some really, like, really incredibly smart, dangerous people out there doing stuff. But that's usually about, uh, you know, acts of terrorism against, the, you know, the sort of state actors. and that. They're not trying to steal. They don't want 50 Bitcoin from you. Like, they're not. That's not what they're after. You know, they might want to, if you, you know, if you have some patents or you've got some, you know, your defense contractor, they may want your intellectual property, but that's for a different reason. Then they, they're never going to tell you they stole it. Right? It, it'll just be there. They'll have it and you won't know it anymore. Um, anyway, I'm talking too much, um, but it, it, it's really interesting um, that that was sort of the perspective of you coming into this sort of uh, environment in, in, in kind of into our world, if you will, around the sort of the technology services world. Um Talk about the step from teaching. Did you go to Ingram from teaching or was was there interim steps in between? That's when I was actually a plumber. 
was, okay. uh, was in the interim. Okay. Was that to figure out what you wanted to do? Or was that a, I, I think I just want to do something hand, with my hands and, and we'll see where it goes. Well, I was really pretty burned out from, from teaching. And my daughter had just been born at that point. And uh, I just, I needed something very concrete. And, you know, like, like you said, do with your hands or something like that. And in some ways it dovetailed into the networking thing nicely because it's still, they're both flow. Right. Right? They're both checks and passes and all these different things to do with flows. And plumbing was just something I'd, I had, um, I don't want to call myself a handyman, but I have some experience, you know, trade experience going in. I guess about the seven different jobs and all that. So right. I was actually, I was plumbing high-end pools. I had a connection. Gotcha. Into a place like that, apprenticed a little bit. No, I was doing plumbing for high-end pools, which is it's fun. It's amazing the stuff you can do with a couple of a couple of pumps and some stuff to make the, you know these beautiful, beautiful displays. All right. So, so why did you quit doing that? Maybe I mean that feels like something you 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 talk about in a way that sounds like you enjoyed it. Okay, so as you were down in underground, you're getting into uh, now that you mentioned pool work, you were you were having to get in or in in in, in holes and in pipes and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know I'm looking at everybody around me. He's got carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, he's got knee problems and arthritis and all this kind of stuff. And I said, I was like, uh, time to move on. That's like actually, I got my degrees out of order. That's actually when I got the associates. Oh, okay. Was while I was while I was plumbing. I got you. Okay. And then okay. then I moved moved into the tech side of things, yeah. and. This is this is one advantage teaching gives you is when you learn how to be a teacher or a trainer, you also learn how to learn and to absorb information very quickly. Right. Right. So, yeah, because the first thing you got to do is learn the material, right, that you're teaching. You don't necessarily know it all uh, right off the bat. Right. So you got to learn it before you teach it to the kids or the I taught six different subjects, too. So, I mean, as one of my professors once said, if you can't study enough to stay one day ahead of a high school, you probably should be a teacher. Right. That makes sense. That's, that's about right. So, um, so, you know, we, we referenced it early, you know, kind of a big issue in training in a hybrid environment is this idea of training, you know, companies are, companies are really, and have been really worried about ongoing training and skill development for a long time. This predates hybrid work, right? You know, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when they used to call it computer-based training, CBT, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And these were just, you know, sort of self, self-serve, you know, self-tracking modules or whatever that you'd go in and do. And, yeah, even even 25 years ago, there was you know talk about you know is this stuff really working? Are people are people actually learning? What how much are they learning? You know that sort of thing. But I do think the hybrid thing has changed at least the aspect. I mean, whether it's a, if it's self guided on the computer uh, or on the internet, it doesn't really matter if it's hybrid or not because it was it was just you and the screen. But now in a hybrid environment where you've got trainers or you've just got man, I mean, forget about formal training. Let's talk about just managers trying to help you know, uh, you know, our lead engineers helping junior engineers, uh, you know, learn new, new skills, understand, you know, get better at what they do. Um, give us some thoughts on how you sort of see that evolving. And do you think the last couple of years have, have, have helped us there in terms of, in terms of being able to be better at it? Yeah. So I think there's two things there. I think first is the understanding that the distance between the person doing the teaching, excuse me, and the person doing the learning and the size to which it's going out make a big difference in technique. So if you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you know, they're sitting next to you, it's relatively easy to train them. Even if you're one-on-one -on -one virtually with someone, it's relatively easy to train them. But expand that to three people, now you're increasing the difficulty. Put up to a classroom or a large presentation, now the difficulty is very, very high. And part of that difficulty is maintaining interest. Right. So the bigger you make the crowd, the more interesting your material has to be to keep them plugged in. That one minute loop video you were talking about comes into play in those situations. <laughs> yeah. The, um, and people tried to incentivize that, right? Um, my wife commented that like all the alcohol in our house has come in some kind of package from something I've either presented at or been to. And I just think <laughs> if we give people something, they'll pay more attention. You know, if we put the mixologist at the end and there's, there's value in that definitely. But that still doesn't guarantee they'll pay attention to the presentation. Um, the presenter has to be both more dynamic and the, make the material more engaging in order to keep people paying attention. And I think there's two things going on during the pandemic with that. I think number one is just natural selection, that there's a lot of people who were extremely, extremely good at their subject matter. 
and who could pass as a presenter with just a few people in a room. But then when they got removed through the screen and they needed to really increase the presentation skills and the interest level, they just couldn't. Right. Yeah. And it was a time where the intangible skills started to become more important than some of the tangible skills. Right. If you're if you're gonna if you're a company, you can hire somebody to train who is like in the you know defense intelligence agency and has done all these you know worked on malware projects, been a white hat, all all these big things. Um, but if they're not a compelling speaker, right after they say their resume, you've got about five minutes before people start to lose interest and right. say, "Oh, this guy's just rambling on." And the screen the screen feels like a flattening uh, a flattening mechanism, right? I mean, it's hard to be. I mean, some people are very charismatic in person. Um, I don't know how much does that, if in your experience, how much does that translate to being charismatic on the screen? It feels not necessarily the same to me. Yeah, um, just both from teacher training and from leadership courses, one of the first things they say is big movements, you know, big body movements, yeah. eye contact, moving around. Don't point, but, you know, use the hand like this. And unless you're standing very far away from your camera, that sort of becomes irrelevant right. when you're presenting. So almost kind of the trained in charisma that some people have is no longer effective and become those people the the my favorite word of the pandemic has been when it comes to work is agility you need people that have agility and, and systems that have great agility and ability to pivot in a hurry and still be effective in the new paradigm All right so if somebody was a dynamic presenter but because it was of their physical presence their choice is to learn to do it through their virtual presence be it facial expressions or what they're putting on the screen or you know some right. people throw on a funny adjust. gif you know yeah it's it's a it's a different skill set and like i said before it, it's it's sort of natural selection right it's going to weed out the people that don't have the skill set but at the same time nobody becomes it's not like people's value and the value of those presentation skills goes totally away because as we transfer back to in person suddenly we're going to once again flip which presentation skills are needed and it's it's too, it's a huge advantage to people to have a level of versatility where they can train both ways. Maybe do both, right? Yeah, and it's it's a huge huge advantage to the learner because that's the other half of it on this is, is the part two, is that as a, a learner, the learner has to be receptive to what's going on. Like, because a lot of people, you know, on a webinar, they do get on the phone, you know, yeah, yeah, for play sure. solitaire or whatever they're doing on that. Put on the one minute loop. We keep going back to that. Um, but you also have to have to discipline yourself as a learner to say, is this information going to be important to me? And if it is going to be important to me, how am I going to keep myself plugged in? Right. So those different cognitive techniques, like, uh, you know, um, for instance, making acronyms out of things, there's this technique where, you know, uh, you know, one is a, let's say, I suppose I could say, one is a gun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, all that. And whatever you're trying to remember, you picture it with that object in it. Yep. It's like a memory, the memorization technique. You've yep. got to start using those techniques when you're doing something virtual. Um, and, yep. and like I said, that's an adapt, that's an adaptation of part of the learner too. And, you know, to put it back into the cybersecurity sphere, there is a huge uptick in people that were being victims uh, of the malware, of the ransomware, of the cybersecurity incidents. And I think part of it was that the, the people, the training picked up. Like we all know the, tra the cyber training picked up almost as soon as this happened, but people weren't receptive or self-disciplined to learn the material they were just clicking through. Yeah. Well, that, that does, that leads to an example, you know, one of the things I've always liked to see about, to see examples or others who've seen, seen examples of, of, of good, you know, things that have done well, things that have been done well. So, you know, do you have any, have you seen any good examples of online training things that you, you know, that really stand out to you um, at, that you could point to, to say, this was really good, and here's why. So I'll start off with the negative example. That was the next question. So you're that's fine. You can just flip the script on me. That's right. Uh, the Sands Institute has great content and really good trainings. If there's someone there to crack a whip on you, a lot of institutions, businesses, what have you, would just pull down a couple of Sands trainings, throw them in a course, and say, "Okay, here you go." Right. Right. That that was that was always problematic. The trainings that succeeded during this this time period were those that understood temporal limitations like i have three minutes before i have to change subjects and i have another three minutes before i have to change subjects again right. and there's a couple of folks um that are on the tech force numerous people like brian rawls who are excellent presenters because they understand that they have a natural inclination to say we're going to change every three minutes if i talk i'm going to intersperse, intersperse a demo after that then a flashy graphic then something with movement to keep people's eyes on the screen that kind of right. thing that um 
it's not just making the content relevant, it's making the content engagingly relevant. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so you mentioned cybersecurity training, and that, that's always, you know, it's been around a while. Um, you know, compliance regimes require it, right? You know, you a lot of times you have your annual security, you know, your annual security training for employees and that sort of thing. And, and it's, you know, for the most part, at least for a long time, was sort of a check the box kind of thing. I felt like, um, then, you know, to, to use the old expression, shit got real when people started getting ransom, you know, started getting hacked or having, you know, having real bad ransomware uh, incidences and, you know, managers, non-tech managers, you know, C-suite people who, you know, were just users of technology and didn't think much about it. saw a lot of this as just an expense on the, you know, on the books, you know, we're paying for this and heart, which really don't know if we're getting any benefit from it. It's hard to prove a negative. Um, all of a sudden got real interested in it. And, you know, companies like No Before and others are doing what feels like good work in this space, but what, what's your take on, on cybersecurity training at the employee level? Where is it? And do you, do you think it's, do you think it's, I mean, it's hard to, I mean, do you think it's better or do you think it's good? And do you think it's better? And, and what, what, what would you like to see happen there to, to make it keep getting better because it needs to. Yeah. So if you, people have talked to me a bunch before, well, I've heard this analogy, but a blue whale and a, a larger but plausible school of sardines have roughly the same biomass. A blue whale takes a very long time to turn, where sardines can just, you know, right. they can turn their whole school instantly. And cybersecurity training, I think the pandemic has shown us, is in the blue whale camp, right? That you're turning things very, very slowly. But like you mentioned, no before, I'll throw in co-fence, uh, because we're going to talk about Fortnite later, I'll throw in Fortifish. Um, there's these... It's companies that put together, we we're just talking specifically about email on, on those last two, companies that put together um, tools that more closely simulate real world scenarios. Because there's a big difference between someone seeing something on a screen and watching a video about phishing versus uh, the act of creation of phishing emails to try to pull the information out of them. Right. And there's a watch card has a product, I can't remember the name right now, where if you click on a phishing email, it, you know, one of the pre-sent ones, or even a real, even a real live one, if you click on it, they'll throw your, your click into a black hole and they'll take you to an appropriate instructional video. Right. Yeah. The sort of train in the, in the moment, as opposed to, you know, sort of proactively on the front end, assuming thing, you know, in, in advance of something happening. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's a little bit of technological mitigation there too, because um, I think this is me predicting a trend that's taken over sort of in the high enterprise service provider level, I think is going to eventually trickle down is a lot of UEBA um, or AI based UEBA user and entity behavior analytics, yep. you know, to say this is, this is a gray action, right? This isn't something that is malicious, but this is something that's suspicious enough. We should flag it or look into it or put the brakes on it or something like that. So we both train in the moment and mitigate in the moment rather than waiting for something, either the user to do something bad or the threat to hit an edge or something along those lines. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> we've mentioned, uh, you know, Fortinet a couple of times just in, in passing, but since you're kind of a Fortinet dude at Ingram, I figured I'd give you a chance to talk a little bit about some of the key themes that, that they're emphasizing, you know, when it comes to customers around, uh, around security and particularly as it relates to networking connectivity, but obviously their mandate is broadening. You just mentioned Fortifish, right? Which is, I mean, I would imagine five years ago or 10 years ago, if, if, if someone, if you told someone at Fortinet, they'd have a phishing product, they probably would have said, we don't do that. That's email stuff. That's somebody else's problem. Like we, you know, we, 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 we protect stuff from getting in, right. As a, as opposed to things from the, from the inside out, uh, maybe not, but that's my, that's my perspective on it. No, that's fair. So Fortinet's one of their big goals is to be what they call a full line vendor. So if you count sub products, I think they have 53 different products right now. So you really can make a four to yeah. a four to suite. And almost all of them will share security information back and forth. So if something hits in one spot, we can fortify all the other spots. Right? Fortify. I'm just throwing in these four. Yeah, I was going to say you're, you're just you're just you're showing fortitude in your use of the the forty uh, meta meta example there. Nice job. But um, so that that's one aspect of it. But I think another aspect is Fortinet's uh, focus before the pandemic they had a big focus on SD WAN. They haven't really taken their focus off of that. I mean, they're a leader quadrant vendor for SD WAN, all that sort of thing. Um, but then the watchword when we got to the pandemic has been zero trust access, 
right? The idea that because everything can be so dangerous and because even registered users can introduce these huge vulnerabilities is that we're going to take networks from widely open to micro segmented and we're going to give people, once they've been verified in their identity, the smallest amount of trust possible to still be actually able to do their jobs. Yeah. And um, so that's a, that's a level at it. And Fortinet has a lot of what they call partner vendors or uh, fabric partners that go into other aspects too, because when we're talking about zero trust, we're talking about edge, right? We're talking about network access controllers. Right. We're talking CASBs and CWPs and, you know, any kind of you know, endpoint verification, that sort of thing. And anything is profiling the identity of an endpoint, multi-factor authentication, all that kind of thing. And that's one way of looking at ZTA and that's looking at network zero trust access, right? Before somebody gets on, we're going to positively identify their identity through at least two factors. You know, NIST has the, the you know, no, have, or are factors right. but at least two out of three so that's a, that's looking at the network but then there's a, a second way of looking at this which is information security that we're not going to secure the network and look at it from a network perspective we're going to look at for, from the perspective where is our information and how is our information moving through the network and then orient our protection around the information itself not necessarily on the access to the network Right, because that assumes that's that's the other zero trust principle, which is assume breach. <laughs> right. right, exactly, exactly. So that's where you get into things, and this is this is for the fabric partners. We're getting into things like uh, endpoint encryption, data classification, tagging, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, any kind of NetFlow controls, you know, uh, cat, like I said, Casby's work, cloud access, security brokers, things along those lines that control the flow of information. And do you know data loss prevention or anomaly detection or things like that in flow instead of just at edge? Right, right. Um, with that kind of a broadening of a mandate, Fortinet is, um, at the very least, it's I think it's fair to say um, competing with the big big boys. Not that Fortinet's not a good size, but um, you know it's it's hard to say that Microsoft is not all in on uh, on zero trust in terms of their stack. So I'm curious to see from a positioning standpoint, how are you guys thinking about that? So Fortinet has a little bit of an advantage there. A lot of people don't know about it. Fortinet is roughly one third of all uh, firewalls shipped worldwide. Actually, one third of all security devices shipped worldwide. And Fortinet uses that like the hoe being dipped in the water that a lot of people have a FortiGate. That's just a given. Yep. Um, Fortune 100 companies all the way down to small mountain and pop shops. There's a FortiGate for everybody, and a lot of people are going to have a FortiGate. So they're a play into that to start competing with the bigger switching vendors and AP vendors and that sort of thing. Number one was technology upgrade, which they did. Uh, number two was the fabric connections. So like your FortiGate, your Forti Switch, and your Forti AP are and um, uh, onboarding NAC are all controlled from one pane of glass and they're all configured as one thing. So like every everything is a port. So like if you've got an SSID on your AP, uh, you can configure that the same way you can configure a physical port on a switch or a physical port on a FortiGate where it's a very unified configuration. Yeah. And then their play after that um, is say, all right, we're gonna expand into like a email, right? So say I've got a Forta sandbox and I've got Forta client, their endpoint and a virus endpoint protection client. And the Forta mail says, this is a suspicious email. I'm going to send it to Forta sandbox because it has an MTA. Forta sandbox is going to look at it and say, all right, yeah, there is something here that's malicious. It's not, uh, doesn't have a CVE entry, doesn't have any kind of defined anything like that. It's a true zero day. I'm going to write a micro definition for it. I'm going to push it out to every, every Fortinet product I had in my environment that has a virus outbreak prevention subscription. So it's instant environmental hardening. And that's something you get specifically because you've got Forta with Forta with Forta. Right, right, right. Now, there are other things that will integrate, like Carbon Black can also use a Forta sandbox. So if you've got Carbon Black on your endpoint, you can still get the same feeding through the same virus outbreak prevention. So Fortinet knows, like, they know they're not just going to suddenly displace an entire environment all at once. So right. I feel like, man, I got to drop like a few hundred thousand dollars now and just rip all, all that old Cisco garbage, you know. Right, right. No offense, yeah. Cisco. Like all networking people, I started in Cisco, but yeah, no, and I mean that they're the you know they're they're they've been around. They they in many ways invented the space, if you will, right? And right, it's hard to argue that Meraki is not a great platform. That when you describe Fortinet in terms of the single pane of glass and having an easy way to to manage you know multiple different um, you know devices on a network. And they sort of made that, I mean, that's why Cisco bought them, <laughs> you know, because they, they did a really good job with that. So, so, and I'm not going to knock Meraki a whole lot because it's a really easy to use product. Absolutely. Like I've barely tipped, dipped my toes in Meraki and I can configure it, but Meraki's vulnerability, and this is not necessarily a vulnerability for security, but a vulnerability for just network uptime is that there really is no 
local management. You know, you've got to go to the cloud and back to do anything. So sure. Fortinet, yeah, it, b- both its its advantages also it's it's a bit of a weakness, right? It's like right, a superhero, I mean, right? Exactly. <laughs> but um, like Fortinet's thing is the master configuration is always on the device itself, no matter what Forta you're looking at, even if you're controlling it from the cloud. Um, or you can throw it for a Forta manager, which could be a VM or a device or Forta, what have you. The master configuration is always on the device. So in the event the connectivity to the cloud is lost or to your manager is lost or something like that, you can still do the necessary operations on the device. And when everything comes back up, resync it. Yep. So that, that's that's Fortinet's play in that space because Fortinet, of course, has Forta Cloud, which contains Forta Gate. Sure, the leverage in the hybrid, the hybrid aspect of it. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um. So let's transition a little bit, maybe just talk some about Ingram because you know we've got customers who maybe never even heard of a distributor, frankly, right? That you know, and then others who have direct relationships with distributors. So there's there's a range of understanding and knowledge about what distributors do. I mean, the lower D distributor people kind of get that, but within our space, and so maybe talk a little bit about you know, kind of when you think about Ingram, what is it? You know, where do you see you guys, where, where do you see your role between sort of the partner? It, let's take a situation since we are an um, MSP and a partner uh, in, in a sort of a three-way relationship where there's Ingram as the distributor, we're the partner, and there's a company. Where do you guys see you guys adding the most value to the company? Forget about us. We're, we're our own. We, we'll figure out. We got to figure out our own stuff. But for the company, why, why does working with someone like Ingram make sense for the company? Mm. So there's a couple of different routes. To Besides getting stuff, I, forget about that. We're not talking about that. You know, that's anybody can do that. Well, not these days. But you, yeah, well, that's true. No, actually, nobody can do it, depending on what it is. <laughs> Sometimes even even we can't do it. But no. Um, so the old view of distribution was that it was warehousing, like you just alluded to. You know, you got your stuff and passed it around. Ingram likes to think of themselves as a value-added distributor. You know, kind of like a value-added reseller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Ingram's play there is that we also provide thought leaders like our business units aren't divided by like you know um vendor or something like that to i mean to a little bit of extent they are but they're divided by technology so like there's um a, you know department dedicated dedicated sbu security business unit uh and there's thought leaders in each each bu like a data center bu has their own data center tech force i'm part of the security tech force everybody's got their own thought leadership there so people don't have to come to us with this is the product I need. They can come to us with, this is my problem. Right. And then we have people who have the knowledge to solve that problem. And the big part of that is, and I'm sure as an MSP, you, you guys know about this, how hard it is to get talent. Right. There's sure. not many security professionals out there. There's not a lot of people who have the specialized skills to do things. But like, I'm a CMMC registered practitioner. So if you need something, you know, in in the uh, DoD contractor space, or I'm I'm leading frameworks in general. So the alphabet soup, you know, like your NIST CSF, but also your HIPAA, your PCI, your MITRES, you know, COBIT, COPPA, SIPA, all the alphabet soup of things. I have the bandwidth in my day to study those. So if you if someone comes and says like, you know, I uh, I have this need to become certified or compliant with the standard. In a very short period of time, what do I do? I don't, right. I don't have 150 grand to hire somebody for six months to put me into this. You know, let me go to Ingram. We can design the environment for like we can't actually go in and set it up. We have you guys to do that or other parties sure. to that and set it. We can say like, okay, this is the problem that you have. Let us get you to a workable solution as fast as we possibly can. Got it. So there's sort of an outsourced solutions engineering component to it, really, and and discovery and solution engineering in terms of assistance around around. Um, the the purchasing of of could be boxes and hardware, but it could be software or solutions or or services as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we have different levels to it. So we have a solutions design and services department, which is you call in, you talk to somebody live on the phone. Usually within a half hour, they've solved your problem, but it's usually a very specific problem. Right, right. Like you know, I just got a new, I got a you know way on upgrade. I need a firewall that's not going to bottleneck the thing. Then you've got we have technical account managers who are specialists on one certain product or product line like for Fortinet, for example, or people who are specialists just on HP Enterprise, things along those lines. Then I'm a technical marketing engineer, so I specialize in an area. Um, my area being frameworks, I am and you know general security talking about Fortinet here. Um, kind of like look at the and as you go each level is broadening the picture of what we're looking at. And yeah, it's it's a bench. 
I mean, we even have people, you know, implementers. No, no one should ever have to say no to anything if you're working with Ingram. You know, we're we're a behemoth, but the the upside of being a behemoth is we have someone and something for everything. Right, right. You got you got breadth, right? From yeah, that exactly. Yeah. Okay. Final question before we kind of wrap up with some you know some personal stuff. Um, when you think about sort of the state of general network and connectivity and kind of the trends that are out there, particularly as filtered through this view of security. Do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about kind of the near term future? I think it'd be foolish to ask someone in technology to say, are you pessimistic about the future? Because I've never met anybody who's pessimistic about the future of technology if you work in it. But in the short term, um, you know, what's your thought on that? I think um, I was actually talking about this with, with someone earlier. I think buzzwords are becoming a problem in the, in, in the industry. I think that's dampening our ability to grow short term. Uh, the most co- the most common example that happens all the time is people say, "Oh yeah, I need a fiber core in my network because it's faster." And a gigabit per second is a gigabit per second. It doesn't matter if it's going over fiber or copper. Right. You know, if somehow I can make it go across my fingers, speed is speed. But people get this perception like, "Oh yeah, I need fiber because fiber is better." Really, the only advantage to fiber is it can go longer distances and it's less susceptible to interference. And then, like you know, wi- Wi-Fi six. Everybody's like, "Oh yeah, I need Wi-Fi six. You know, I need to get that in my, you know, get that in my deployment right away." And it's true that there's like a there's a level of future proofing to that. But at the same time, I challenge you to walk through your environment and count how many devices can actually be right capable of connecting <clears throat> to Wi-Fi six. But it's it's a buzz thing, and then yeah. people price themselves like, "Oh man, I can't get new APs that have more security," because I you know I can't afford to go out and spend a thousand dollars in AP on these new Wi-Fi AX, you know, Wi-Fi six things. And I, I think when you get to a certain level of buzzwords, you're actually hampering innovation. Um, you're getting oh, no people, question. Yeah, people are people are running towards a finish line that they don't know exists or don't even know which way they're supposed to be running or something like that. And I think of uh, and there's buzzy technologies like Elon Musk and his his mind link or something like that planning yeah. computers in our brains or something like that like that's a cool buzzy technology even just vr in general is a cool buzzy technology but it's so far off from being a practical use to the everyday user that we're getting ourselves caught up in a cycle actually actually vr is a good thing vr has been predicted to be the next big thing since like the 80s it's yeah. never been the next big thing and it's probably still never going to be the next big thing just because you don't have the implementation for it but hey man, we got to get that we got to get a vr environment where people walk through our office you know those types of things. Yeah, that was one of the impetuses for cut the shit was this very thing. <laughs> Jargon, right? We we the guys that founded Plow and myself included are business people first who learn technology. You know, we're not we're not technologists. I mean, we're not uh, you know, we're not programmers, we're not developers, not engineers. Um but we see that uh, you know, there's a I wouldn't call it a fear. That's maybe not the right word. But there's a an attraction or a, a an unwillingness to to look like you don't know what you're talking about. So when someone does throw out buzzwords and jargon or shiny penny kinds of new technology things that maybe are not necessary, you know, oftentimes they're sledgehammers to to hit nails. Um, you know, we 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 really we kind of have a visceral reaction against that. So I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear you say that as someone who's much more technical than I am. Um, in in that sense, so. Yeah, no, I, I think you're totally fair there. I'm not going to rag on anything necessarily, but one other good example I just thought of with this is IBM's Curator. It's an amazing product. It's capable of mind-blowing things. It also starts at like a million MSRP. Yeah. So when when somebody gets convinced they need Curator and they're like a hundred employee, you know, insurance business or something like that, you know, yeah, same. Book. You can't do this, man. Whether it it doesn't matter if it's it doesn't matter if it's a good idea for you or not. <laughs> you can't afford it. Yeah, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's like you might like to drive a Ferrari, but you probably can't afford it. So that might praise a budget. Yeah, that's right. And your Honda will still get you to wherever you need to go. No, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Well, let's uh, let's transition a little look personal, and then I'll let you get back to work. Um. Again, I always like to wrap up with just a couple of things to sort of get a little bit of insight into the into my guests in terms of what they're into. So, uh, tell us about something you've watched or read lately that uh, you think others ought to check out. So I've recently been rewatching World War Z with Brad Pitt, which you know a lot of people are like, oh, it's a zombie movie, but there's this it's it's there's this aspect of realism to it other zombie movies don't have in that the zombies act more like ants 
or insects or something. They're the only fast zombies that I know of, right? They're almost always slow in every other movie. Right, slow and stupid, whereas these, like, there was a point where they're breaking into, um, I think it's Jerusalem, you know, and they're going up this wall to climb each o- over each other to get to the top. Yeah. I think there's a certain certain metaphor for all of humanity contained in that movie about the fact that you can intelligently do something in a way that's purposeful, or you can just be part of the horde that runs through. A few people get on the top, and most everybody else is just getting trampled on the path. Right, right. Wow. Existential and philosophical all at once. Who knew? Yeah, with Brad Pitt, yeah. And with Brad Pitt. Yeah. Looking good while we're doing it. Exactly. Um, all right. Last question. Um, tell us about your first technology memory as a child and it, and it can't be TV or the phone or something. It's gotta, you gotta be real. Okay. So I'm going to hybridize this a little bit because I'm going to throw video games under TV, but there was this thing called Sega channel. I don't know if you remember Sega channel Yep. where you you hooked it up to your cable provider and there was a slate of games. You could download a game it actually worked by um, rotating, like everybody got a piece of a game and your little thing just listened for the piece of the game. That's how it took so long to download and aired so much. But like, that was the first time I thought of the connectivity side of technology. Yeah, well, that's why they, I mean, they were breaking it up like that because they couldn't, it was too big or right? they couldn't, couldn't get it to, couldn't get it to work. <laughs> Whereas nowadays that's an infinitesimal amount of data. We probably do through just flashing a flashing a flashlight at each other. But no, it was the first time I thought about the, the connectivity of things. And then like my dad worked at a university. So I was one of the first people to um, really have internet access. I could use in a meaningful way. Right. Yes. It was, it wasn't on a switch. It was on a, it was a thing that came before switches. Like, wait, like an ISDN or something. No, where only one computer could get information from the internet at a time. Ah, what the heck were those called? Oh, yeah, it's like a repeater or something. I, 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 yeah. Either way, there, a hub, I think it was a hub. Or okay. Something. I don't know what it was. But either way, there was five computers in the lab, and you had to coordinate who was going to get on the internet at a given time because only one person could actually right, right. send information. You'd knock off the other. You'd knock off the other if you... Right. Yeah. And it, but it was, you know, it was one of those, it was connectivity that always sort of got me into technology that you could take what would normally be a human face to face connection and in some ways stretch it out. And I think that's got a continuous realization that's never going to happen. You know, humans are social beings who have a continuous urge to connect and communicate through whatever means we possibly can. And we've been talking about it. We talked about, you know, video training and that kind of thing. Networking, as much as it's about technology, is about people and people to people. Right. That was once again really philosophical. Off Sega Channel. Yeah. Off <laughs> if Sega, Sega was channel. still around, I'd write them a letter telling them about. They they would they would love it. They might use you in a commercial. So yeah, right. Well, Michael, listen, I appreciate the time. This has been great. Um, thanks for shedding some light, particularly on training and and kind of leveraging your educational expertise and background uh, to help us think through some of this. So um, again, really appreciate you being on Cut the Shit. Take care. Yeah, you too. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at cuttheshit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok at cut the shit pod all one word where we post lots of clips from the podcast and last but not least you can also watch the youtube version of the show on our youtube channel at plow networks until next time take care and have a great day